Testing, testing. <laughs> okay, no, we're ready. We're ready. Good morning, and welcome to our worship service at the Bath Church of the New Jerusalem in Bath, Maine. It's very comforting to be here this morning. I'm going to talk about comfort today. That's the whole theme. And uh, this has been an, a week that hasn't been very comforting for any of us. We got one of our uh, every three or four years April snowstorms. At my house, we got 22 inches of wet snow with some rain to make it heavier and you could stand in my yard and listen to the pine trees crack <laughs> and most of those limbs were falling on power lines and so it's been quite a week uh, my power came back on last night thank goodness it went out last Thursday so I have not had a comforting week but it's very comforting to be talking about comfort today because we are this close we were just talking about that, Lee and I. We are this close to being uncomfortable all the time. We just don't know it. If you think you're comfortable, have somebody throw the switch on your house and you have no, and no electricity, all of a sudden you are not in control of anything. It's a strange feeling, not a, not a fearful feeling. There was no danger. But at the same time, I lost complete control of everything. And uh, I could hardly get this these uh, the sermon printed and uh, you, I won't tell you what I did to get to this point but it involved two computers a cell phone and some PDF files and an email uh, how all that worked I don't know what my daughter figured it out so here we are and we're talking about comfort and discomfort 
from a storm is bad enough. But I'm going to talk today about the kind of discomfort that we're all experiencing in this crazy world as it has recently, I would say, in the last few years, turned upside down. Bad things happening. And it creates a lot of discomfort. And what's worse is it's worse because it's continuous. If it was a hurricane or a two-foot snowstorm, that's okay. But what if this discomfort just kept coming, 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 coming? That's what we're going to talk about today. There was a prophet named Isaiah. You've probably heard of him. He will tell you all about comfort. And when he's done, you will feel better. So that's what we'll talk about today. Comfort. It's all very comfortable here in this nice, warm church. So rise, please, for the opening of the word. From 2 Corinthians, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we, in turn, may comfort others. Wonderful passage. Our first hymn this morning is, is a children's hymn. It's in our, hymn, in our liturgy. It's supposed to be a children's hymn, but I love it, and we haven't played it in a long time. And I like the words, and so just imagine that you're just a big child here this morning, and we will sing number 448, Heavenly Father, You Are Near. Amen. Wonderful song. Our recitation this morning is in your bulletin. It's not in the red book because I took some pieces out of Psalm 27 and zipped them together. It's a wonderful set of passages. We'll begin to read it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Hide not your face from me, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Now that last line is going to become important here in a few minutes because we are told to wait. And we're going to talk about how important that is. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you are the true light that enlightens everyone who comes into the world. Shine, we pray in our hearts, so that the darkness of evil and error being driven away, we may seek clearly the way of your commandments 
and humbly and gladly walk in them, avoiding all evil and performing the good and useful works that you would have us to do. Grant this for your mercy's sake, Lord. Amen. And now we pray the prayer that the Lord has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And now we pray a prayer for our own Bath New Church, saying together, Heavenly Father, Make this church of ours, we pray, a place where men and women of all conditions may come face to face with you and know firsthand your love, truth, and power. Bless this church, O Lord, in all its activities. Renew its vitality. Strengthen its faith and reliance on you alone. Fill our lives with the single motive of serving you and our neighbors, making the Bath New Church a center of spiritual inspiration for the community all around. Make us a portal for the new Jerusalem that is even now coming into the world. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord, the teachings of our church, as it's written in Isaiah, the mighty prophet Isaiah. You want comfort, go to Isaiah. That's a good tip. I'm going to read some of chapter 40. Come, uh, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass. All its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measures heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Skipping down a bit. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them 
and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. Here's the good part. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's a long passage from Isaiah. It's wonderful poetry. It's wonderful truth. And uh, there's a lot more where that came from. Next, from John's Gospel, chapter 14. The Lord's saying, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And finally, from Secrets of Heaven, 87, 64. Someone, a bearing someone on wings like eagles means being raised on high, even into heavenly light. For bearing means being raised. Wings, spiritual truth. And an eagle means the rational mind in respect of truth. The reason why one is raised into it by means of the truths of faith is that the truth of faith is what raises a person right up to heaven where the good of faith is. The rational mind with respect to truth is meant by an eagle because the rational level of a person's mind is their heaven or their sky and in relation to the natural level is, so to speak, the earth. For the rational constitutes the internal person and the natural the external. The meaning of wings as God's truth is also clear from Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Amen. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of the Lord, the teachings of our church, and keep them.
Let us pray. We pray at this time for the sick as we do each week. There are certain people among us, some we know, some not, some we don't, but they're directed our way so that we can raise them up to the Lord, so that He can bring them healing. And we know from our teachings that what we might think of as healing might be what the Lord sees in His mind. His ways are not our ways, we know that. But we raise these people up and we say, Lord, take this person and give this person what he or she really needs, and we thank you for that. Lord, remember Beth this morning and Eddie. Remember Jacob and Todd. Remember Deborah, Lily and Laurie. Remember Keith this morning and Eric. Remember Donna, Phyllis. Remember Kay and her grandson, Thomas. I don't think any of us in this room or any of our congregations ever met Thomas, but we know he needs your help, and you know him. Remember Teresa and David. Remember Tristan, Aaron. Remember Brad and Dave. Remember Dave this morning, Lord, and Forrest as he deals with his recent loss. Be with him, Lord, and bring him comfort. Remember Kathy and Tim and Jane. And Lord, there are others. You know them. We ask you to go to them and bring them that thing that only you can bring. Amen. Now each one of us comes to you, Lord, in the quiet of our heart to speak with you about things that only we might know. Amen. Now I pray a prayer from the seventh century, Mose Arabic liturgy, Spain, as modern then as it is now. O Christ our Lord, who art the physician of salvation, grant unto all who are sick the aid of heavenly healing. Look upon all faithful people who are suffering and who call upon your name, and take their souls into your keeping. And deliver them from all sickness and infirmity, body and soul, now and forever. Amen. And now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's a wonderful passage. Can you imagine being able to run and not becoming weary? We have a lot to handle these days as we try to go about our business in an atmosphere charged with strange, confusing, even frightening events. I'm sure you wonder, as I do, how am I supposed to process all these things as they continue on and on? The endless stream of bad news and the endless bleating of politicians who leave anxiety in their wake for the uncertainty they convey. Hmm. Now, one of my jobs is to talk about doctrines, teachings, tools, I call them, for the difficult job of living in this chaotic world that has been turned so upside down. What are these tools, these doctrines, for the new Jerusalem? Well, here's a couple, two or some, few. Truth, we're going to talk about truth sometime. What about truth? It will make you free, we're told. The Lord Himself tells us that. Free of what? Free of anxiety, free of fear. But you know, not just truth you read the Gospels, what did the Lord tell His disciples? He didn't say the truth will set you free. That's what everybody says. You hear that from all. Politicians love that. But they're ignorant. They don't know about truth. 
the Lord said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Then you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. First, he says, continue in my word. They always forget that part. Truth, it will set you free. What's another doctrine? Well, there's a doctrine that explains spiritual, natural causation. It's a wonderful doctrine. Natural things, I always point to that tree out there, natural things take their very existence from the spiritual things to which they correspond. That's why that tree's there. It corresponds with something in the spiritual world. And as long as the correspondence is not broken, there it'll be. And that tree itself stands for truth of a kind. And we'll talk about that. I'm going to talk about all these in the next few weeks. The origin of evil. Now, you know I like to talk about evil. But the origin of evil is interesting. You see, God didn't do it. It was us. We fell away. It's right there in Genesis. There's the story. God didn't do it. Now, the Gnostics are interesting people. They appeared at about the time of uh, Christ. And they had, a, they had a take on Christianity, but they got it kind of muddled up. They said, you know, since there's evil in the world, and there is, of course, then, and God created the whole world, then there's got to be part of God that's evil. Dumb, but that's what they said. No. God created the world to be good. And it's right there in Genesis, Garden of Eden. And then what happened? We fell away. God said, do these things. And Adam and Eve said, no, we're not going to do that. We know better. All right. Origin of evil is a very fascinating topic. And order, I've talked about that recently. God is order itself. That's what God is. So how does evil work? Evil works to overcome order and to cause disorder. That's the, and that is, the, that is the sum total of what the evil spirits are up to. If there's order, they want disorder. If there's any disorder in the world, look back to who's causing it. That person's not a nice person. They're trying to take divine order that comes into nature, into our world, and flip it. Cause disorder. Talk about that sometime. And then I think last week I said, thought from the eye closes the understanding. But thought from the understanding opens the eye. You see, believing is seeing. Not the other way around. People say, well, seeing is believing. No, we were told last week from what we read that the natural eye will see. And sometimes it will see an appearance that's not even correct, but it will believe it. Did you see that? I didn't see it. I was too sleepy. Did you see the sun come up this morning? Well, it didn't come up. The earth went down, you see. But that's an appearance. The sun rising is an appearance. It's a good appearance. But your natural eye believes that the sun comes up. You see, what if you were told some evil thing was real when it wasn't? Because it was an appearance. And your natural eye saw it and you believed it. You'd be a sucker is what you would be. We've got to learn to use our spiritual eye along with the natural eye. I've got to stop. I'm going into a sermon here. So that's another doctrine. All right? And importantly, last week, Easter... We learn, actually it was from Rebbe Nachman, my favorite uh, Jewish Zadik. He says, things can go from the very worst to the very best in just the blink of an eye. And we talked about that when the women went to the tomb. Bad, terrible, ter terrible things. Bad, Jesus is dead. We're sitting by the tomb. We don't even know why. And all of a sudden, there he is. Well, they went from really sad to really happen, happy, just like that. And Rabbi Nachman says, that can happen all the time if we got our mind right. And that's a hard thing to do. Tools. I call those tools. All of them are gifts from the Lord to us in the new revelation to help us find meaning and explanations in this world so suddenly new. These divine truths are tools. And there's nothing like these tools in all the religions of the world. See, these are practical tools. The new church isn't just new in name. It is new in what it teaches about how the worlds work. This world, spiritual world. Tell you how they work. No other religion can do that. And if we ever needed to know this, it would be about now, I think. There are more teachings. 
And there are many more. Oh, I was going to put my chart out here. Hang on. Don't go away. I'll go get it. It's right here. Sorry about that. I'm a little frazzled this morning, actually. There, you've seen that. It's my road map. So there are many more doctrines. Look at all that. We can talk about all of these. Every one of those represents a practical new way of looking at spiritual reality. It's an infinite number of these, actually. That's just how many I put on that chart. So, there's lots. The writings for the new church are limitless sources for these tools. What are they tools for? Abundant living, that's what it says. But there's something else we need today. And it's very important to go with all these doctrines, okay, teachings, truths. You get me? We need something else. And sometimes we forget to go there. What I hear and see and read every day is almost too much to bear some days. Oh, I process it, run it through my rational mind, that's that cerebral cortex at work, and I tag it and I store it with all that other information. Try to make sense out of it for future use. The human mind is marvelous that way. But there is a part of me, a part of that marvelous human mind, deeper and more remote from the conscious control of the rational mind that is not so well disciplined, not so rational, not so calm. And that deeper part, what does it need? It doesn't need any more truth. It's got plenty of that. Cerebral cortex takes care of that. The rational mind takes care of that. That other part, we might call it the limbic brain if you wanted to get scientific. What does that brain need? It needs comfort in all of this nonsense. It needs comfort when my cerebral cortex is looking for tools. It's looking for tools to say, oh, look at all these. I love these tools. Let's use them. And meanwhile, that deeper brain says, oh, I need comfort. You know what I'm talking about. That part needs strengthening as it grinds along amid all that rationality. Sometimes we forget about that part of our brain, and that's the part that'll bring us down. So, we went to Isaiah today, we're going to Isaiah to find hope in the face of hopelessness, comfort in the face of anxiety, strength in the face of weakness, and rest from our weariness. We need all that. Can, I, can Isaiah give us all that? Well, the Lord surely can. And when he needed someone to step up and deliver these blessings to the people of Judah and to all people forevermore, and that's you and me, it was Isaiah who said, Himini, here am I. Remember that story? I throw that in every now and then. It's just such a wonderful story. The Lord said, who shall we send? And Isaiah heard him. He said, Himini, here am I. He said, send me. The cool part, remember? He didn't know where he was going. He just said, I'm signing up. And he had no idea for what. There's a sermon in itself. That's in Isaiah chapter 6. Now, who was Isaiah? Well, what makes him a perfect source of comfort and strength in our present state of mind? Well, he was a mighty man of God who lived about 2,700 years ago in a time of great distress, discomfort for Judah. He stood up in his lifetime to four powerful kings in his long, very fruitful ministry, and then he was killed by the fifth king who would not tolerate hearing the truth. A lot of kings like that. Isaiah, it's a powerful message, but also what eloquence in the words on which that message comes. Parts of it are unsurpassed in all of literature. What I read this morning was wonderful. Just wonderful words, if nothing else. Isaiah's message, there's an internal message there, it repeats itself in cycles of, over and over he has cycles of, get this, Decline, descent, desolation, way down there. Then what? Hope, comfort, and finally renewal. You'll find that in many parts of Isaiah. It's, it's, 
of course it sounds familiar. Isaiah has regeneration on his mind. That's how regeneration works. It's a circle. He is the prophet of the great cycle of return and restoration. Two beautiful Hebrew words. Teshuvah, return. Tikkun, restoration. He's the prophet of that. From the depths of Judah's desolation, he is the prophet of hope because as the Apostle John explained, he saw the glory of Jesus Christ and spoke of him years before the Messiah. Chapter 40, our lesson today, confirms all of this about Isaiah. He can bring the Lord very near to us. He can comfort us. He can renew our strength. It isn't complicated. In beautiful language that by itself can cause a change of mental state, we find strong and simple promises. What do we find in Isaiah? He says, comfort my people. That's the Lord's clearly stated purpose. Oh, he has other things in mind too, but his main thing is to comfort you. Because he knows that since we fell away, life became complicated and most of us are not comforted most of the time. Comfort my people. What else does he tell us? He says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Most of what I read this morning from Isaiah had to do with the glory of the Lord. Isaiah reveals that glory in language unsurpassed. He also tells us the Lord shall come to us with a strong hand. And it goes on to say arm. And that represents strength. It's an image. But that strong image there. And then what else came next? But he will gather the lambs with his arm. And carry them in his bosom and gently lead those sheep who are with young. He can be both ways. Strong and mighty, but gentle. You see, that's the way the Lord is. And he says, the everlasting God, the Lord, neither faints nor is weary. And that's a good image. And finally, he tells us the greatest promise of all. I read it. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with strong wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We're lucky enough where we live here to see eagles. See them all the time over by the river. And when you see that, you think, what a powerful bird. You see hawks, you see vultures. I like vultures. They're really neat. But then comes an eagle. It's like, whoa, that's way different. Mighty bird. There's that image. Mount up with strong wings like eagles. So, that's what that other part of me needs to hear, you see. While my rational mind puts those powerful tools to work. I need both. There are two basic promises that the Lord makes to us in chapter 40. Comfort and strength. Okay? And we need those now. We need them right now. Comfort because we are unsettled by the things going on all around us. And strength because we are growing weary from too much attention, too much vigilance, too much to worry about, and especially worrying about tomorrow. We do too much of that. So we need comfort, but we need strength. Bookends. The first and the last things of Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah's got it all, I'm telling you. To help us understand spiritual principles, the teachings for the new church often go to natural processes. For examples, things we can see and understand in our own world that correspond to higher things. We can do this with comfort and strength. How are they related? Well, why are they first and last, we'll ask. Think of your own body. It's a framework of natural substance, natural stuff, huh? That allows your mind, which is a spiritual thing, incidentally, to act in this world. So here's a pile of stuff called a body, and then here's a mind which is in the spiritual world. Wow. And that mind can act in this world. How? An idea, here's, here's the way it works. An idea, let's say you get an idea, so I'm going to raise my left arm, okay? All right, you get an idea. It originates, who knows where, and we call it the inmost of the mind, at that spiritual level of the mind, okay? And then it descends from there, somehow, into the neurons of the brain. That's the big mystery. How does it actually do that, okay? It descends into the neuron. Now it's coming into the natural world. 
And they take this idea, it's now encoded in electrochemical language, and it takes that message to your muscles and your nerves, right? And then it happens. But see, this happened, uh, this, this happening originated in the spiritual world, in my mind. That little gap, it's called the nexus between spirit and nature. We're working on it. No one can quite figure it out. Spiritual into natural. How many times a day does that happen in your own body and mind? Huh? Billions of times a day. We don't even notice the miracle. Every time an idea descends into your mind, then your brain, then your muscles and your nerves, and then you do something, that's a miracle. We don't even think about it. But there are limits to this spiritual stream. And these are on the natural end of the system. That natural end has limits. The spiritual, no limits, but the natural does. You see, nervous impulses cannot continue forever. A thing called extinction occurs. The physiologists will tell us that. With continuous stimulation of a nerve cell, slower and slower, it responds until it just can't fire anymore. It's not dead. It's out of gas, basically. The muscles work the same. They tire out, they slow down, they weaken, and finally they just, won't, they just quit. It's all from what you might call depletion. Neurotransmitters in the gaps between neurons in the nervous system, those little molecules, and it's from ATP energy molecules in the muscles. They're depleted, run out of it. So what corrects this problem? Get this, time. Time does that. The time required to make new ATPs, got to synthesize them, it takes a while, and new, trans, new neurotransmitter molecules, you have to synthesize them, it takes a while. At the time to clear out the waste materials, okay, from these tissues, and to restore cellular chemistry to normal. That takes time. You know it, you've, you've experienced this. You're doing something, you're so tired, you've got to quit, and we've got to rest a minute. How do we renew our strength? I love this. We wait. Nothing else will do. You can't drink it. You can't eat it. You can't do anything. You just have to wait. And we call this rest, okay? And it corresponds to the spiritual comfort that Isaiah promises. What did our lesson say? He, those who wait on the Lord. I love that. Those who wait on the Lord, they'll be renewed. Guess what? There's no other way. You've got to wait. We work, and then we wait. The physical model says that rest and strength are directly related. We deplete our energy and then we renew it again with rest. This is another one of those primal cycles of life. And if we don't, what happens then? Well, we fall into states of anxiety. Now, the a psychologist call that stress when we don't wait. You ever done that? Do it all the time. And despair is called depression by those same psychologists. Okay? And these states, over time, invite disease, which is always looking for a doorway in. Disease is kind of like an evil spirit. It's always weaseling its way in. If it can find a doorway, stress, depression, that's a doorway. So rest and renewal, comfort and strength, they are the same. And what we know about one will help us understand the other. We can apply our knowledge of this natural cycle. And again, we use this as an example. We apply the, our knowledge of this natural cycle to the cycles of our spiritual life, you see. How do we rest or find comfort? How do we wait when the emotional load is just, just keeps building up? The bad news just keeps coming day after day with no relief in sight. How do we find spiritual rest that will renew our souls? Well, we look, to, we look for a physiological pattern that fits our needs. Like, you don't sleep once a week and then go like mad for six days, do you? It'd be nice if you could, wouldn't it? But you can't. It doesn't work that way. You go a while, you sleep a while, and you repeat this pattern over and over. Fatigue, rest, depletion, renewal. It's a cycle that you cannot deny. So if you find yourself spiritually depleted, we call that fatigued, maybe, spiritual fatigue, as manifested by what? Anxiety or despair. And that's what that is. How can you expect Sunday worship 
to carry you six days running. Same idea. It can't. Your spiritual health depends on the same cycle. Use the tools a while, and then you need some comfort, rest, to renew your strength. The model's right there. You just have to follow it. Sunday worship, it's important for instruction, yes, but also for fellowship, connections, renewal on that broadest level that social animals like ourselves so badly need. That's what that's for. But Sunday worship may not be enough. Week is seven days. Why not add some comfort and strength in between the Sundays? There's an idea. The Bible, this Bible right here, is waiting to serve that cycle of depletion and renewal. Isaiah has 65 other chapters. You might want to start there. Well, it's big. It's okay. The Bible is waiting to serve that cycle of depletion and renewal. Hope, comfort, strength are yours for the taking. It's right here. The Psalms were written for just that purpose. How about this? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Well, that's just one that we already know. Everybody knows that one. How many Psalms? I think 150. There's a lot of Psalms there. There are so many other Psalms of hope, comfort, renewal. What about the Gospels? With the, as they say, words of Christ in red, huh? As the publisher puts it. They publish Bibles, they print them, and they put the words of Christ in red. If you ever, just for fun, try to find, go to a bookstore, try to find a Bible without the words of Christ in red. I found one, but you have to look around. They do that, it's okay. But they're the parts that I prescribe for people in anxiety or despair. I've actually prescribed that. I've written prescriptions to people who are just in trouble. But the name just on a prescription pad. Words of Christ in red. Read them. <laughs> Rip it off. Give it to them. People love prescriptions. And I've done that more, way more times than you might imagine. I tell them, you're not sick. You're just worn out. Here, <laughs> read this. And they will. And they get better. Those red parts are the Lord himself speaking directly to you. What could be better than that? They are words of what? Hope, comfort, and renewal. To cycle between your periods of intense spiritual work. Now remember, you're still working over here with these doctrines. But you need renewal and hope, comfort. Why not work and rest? Work and rest all during the week. How about daily? That'd be okay if you have time. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, that's a good interval. Or whenever you feel spiritual fatigue. Are you too busy? Well, did you find time to sleep this week? I bet you did. As busy as you were, you had to. Your natural cycle of depletion and rest could not be denied. What makes you think your spiritual life is any different? They correspond. Natural fatigue, spiritual despair. I'm not talking about great blocks of time either. Who has great blocks of time? Just 20 minutes here and there devoted to reading the Word alone, together in the car. You can get it on a CD. I once listened to the entire Holy Bible on CD when I was commuting one of two or three years in a row. It was kind of neat. You know why I liked it? They didn't skip anything. You know when you're reading, you say, I'm going to read Chronicles. Good luck on that. It's just all names, lists of names, lists of names. And so you kind of go, not this guy. He was reading them all. Every word in that Bible he read. And I got used to it. And there's something very comfortable, comforting about the fact that we're just running through. And Swedenborg tells us all those names correspond to spiritual societies, spiritual reality. So when we're reading that, angels are just delighting in it. Normally we just skip those, huh? Not that one. You can get that on a CD. It's wonderful. Now imagine how this might help you unload some of that emotional burden. Imagine how it might comfort you when you're anxious. Imagine how it might help you renew your strength. We need all the help we can get. We know that. Our help is in the name of the Lord, said King David in Psalm 124. And it is. Where can we find this essence and power to use in our daily lives? Isaiah points the way. But what did our Lord say in our other lesson today? This is it's getting good here. 
If you love me, keep my commandments, he said. That's incidentally what loving the Lord is all about. How do you love God? I used to wonder about that when I was a kid. In fact, for a long time, how do you love God? Simple. If you love me, keep my commandments. Do what he says. Simple. All right. Then he says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. See, he was leaving at this point. That he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You see, here's truth right here, all these things. But, but it's not by itself. There's a spirit in all of those doctrines. That spirit is the spirit of truth. That will come to you. And guess what? There's a lot of names for it. A helper is what it's called. Hmm. And another name for helper. Ready for this one? Comforter. That's what we're all about today. It's the Holy Spirit that the Lord promised he would send. The teachings for the new church tell us in language clear enough for children to understand. The comforter, the helper, friend, you could call it that. All divine truth exists from divine good and proceeds from it. This is from Secrets of Heaven. The divine truth is the holiness of the Spirit which proceeds from the Lord and is called the Spirit of Truth. Uh, from Apocalypse Revealed. The Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, which is also the Holy Spirit, is the divine proceeding. And this is the Lord Himself. So that Helper, that Comforter, is the Lord Himself in you. You just have to know it. Then you can kind of get used to that idea. In times of despair, we need tools. How would you repair a house without hammers and saws and squares and screwdrivers and tape measures and all that? How would you do that? But you can't use those tools 24 hours a day. You become exhausted. The job will suffer. You'll cut the board wrong. You will despair. You must work a while and then rest a while. Use your energy and get it back again, but only if you wait. And that takes time, the most precious commodity of all. The energy dynamics of your spiritual life are no different. Who shall renew their strength? Who shall wait on the Lord? Those who take the time to allow this comforter to flow in in unseen ways in a process, just like physical rest, and it must proceed on its own pace, it cannot be hurried up. You ever try to hurry and rest? I have. It doesn't work. Just like physical rest, you must not skip it. Depletion will result with spiritual fatigue. And what are those? Anxiety and despair. How long, O oh Lord, we may ask, as the strength of our resolve is tested? Isaiah asks this question in, in uh, chapter 6. From the same chaotic circumstances we find ourselves in today, his world was a mess, just like ours. What does the Lord offer us in the genuine truths of his word? In this book, what is ours for the taking from the Psalms, from the red parts of the Gospels, from Isaiah's exquisite poetry? What do we get? Comfort and strength. Comfort and strength. To go the distance as shock turns to despair and despair to resolve. Comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Cry out to her. And her warfare has ended. And her iniquity is pardoned. Jerusalem corresponds to the church, incidentally. Again, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with strong wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And we'll end on that beautiful note. Amen. Now our hymn is 384. A good ending hymn. Uh, abide with me is the name of it. It's a good hymn that promises comfort.
While we're standing, we'll repeat <clears throat> our adoramus, our faith in the glorified Lord. We'll say this together. We worship <clears throat> the one God, the Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose humanity is divine, who for our salvation did come into the world and take our nature upon him. He endured temptation even to the passion of the cross. He overcame the hells and so delivered humankind. He glorified his humanity, uniting it with the divinity of which it was begotten. So he became the redeemer of the world. Without him, no mortal could have been saved. And they are saved who believe in him and keep the commandments of his word. This is his commandment, that we love one another as he has loved us. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have promised to come to us as the spirit of truth. Come to us today, we pray, that we may learn to put your truths to work and come to us, as you also promised, as our comforter, because we are weary and we are heavy laden. May we welcome your Holy Spirit into our minds so that it may be manifested in our good works that testify to your strength of purpose, your power over evil, your gentleness of heart. Lift us up, we pray on eagles' wings, and strengthen our resolve to follow you in all your ways. Amen. Rise, please, for the benediction. The Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Be seated.
Well, this ends our service. I won't reiterate what I said because I said